Hi there. The reason why things have been a little bit quiet on the vlog front of late is I'm pleased to say I'm really, really busy as a composer working on a multi-episodic TV series. That means a TV series that contains multiple episodes. Often on this vlog, I talk about how our job title, Media Composer, is somewhat a mistitle, a misnomer, because very little of what we do is compose. I guess the buck stops at if you're not getting the right notes in the right order, then you're going to get laid off. But there's many other reasons why you could possibly fail on any particular job as a media composer, because you're not actually just a composer. You're a head of department, a HOD. You are responsible for delivery of the score. You are responsible personally liable for it being free of any copyright claims or illicit samples alongside delivering it on time to the broadcast specifications laid out within the contract. And whilst different tropes, genres will challenge you in different ways as a composer and there will be different dare I say it, challenges for, uh, say, for example, the difference between a romantic comedy and an action movie. I would have to say the biggest challenge for a head of department, I think, is multi-episodic television. With computer games, you're very much part of the music or sound department. You are not physically, or very rarely, putting your music into the game. That is being done to you, so you're very much being led. With film, it's a much more linear process, although it's been delinearized, if that's a word, uh, since the advent, really, of digital uh, editing, um, so that things tend to be stacked more than you know okay so we've got to send this off to be processed at the lab and you need to kind of physically write that out and then you've got seven copyists to copy out the score etc etc it is still relatively a, an a to z process with multi-episodic you're working on multiple a to z's simultaneously and in the uk this doesn't tend to be too much of a challenge because our seasons tend to be six episodes, maybe eight, something like Sherlock is three. But in this era of streaming, particularly this era of the streaming wars, us UK composers are really getting a taste of our American cousin's medicine. So as with most of us composers, um, it's a, a process that's evolved and you adapt to, depending on the challenges of particular projects and the knowledge that you're equipped with i've been in this business for about 25 years and um, i think that these vlogs are useful not really for me to say this is the way it's done i'll be asking you many questions on how i can improve this process but really to exchange notes so i'll be really interested in the comments you leave down below this video I think it's going to be a total of 22 episodes uh, all in um, divided into two seasons running concurrently on move from left to right um, uh, you people who have regular to this vlog have noticed that I've gone from the big telly down to a smaller screen and now I'm on three screens uh, this is simply for workflow purposes the reason I don't use an ultra wide is because I do a lot of tutorials, so, that, so this aspect is correct for tutorials. I've got a large LG running uh, Pro Tools, I've got a smaller LG running all of my notes, and this is my main screen running Logic. I'm running off a single Mac, and it's a beast, it's this. Can I say that it never falls down? Um, no. I would say that this is the least reliable Mac I've ever used. Um, it can't even shut down on its own. I have to physically press the button. Uh, we've looked into it, but it just seems to be struggling on under the weight of the operation that I'm throwing at it. And I'll get to maybe why that is in a minute. In a fit of peak, I was very upset about something. I don't know if you do this. I made a rash purchase and I've never experienced retail remorse than buying this Apple monitor 
It is a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a monitor that's going to be used solely for logic. I even got the nano coated glass. However, this thing is a life changer because for the first time since moving here seven years ago, I can work like this. Basically, I have a south facing window. There's nothing I can do about that. And because I live in Edinburgh, the sun basically skips across the horizon for most of the year. So this is a, an amazing sun trap. And I know what you're going to say. That surely the sun never shines in Edinburgh. Well, actually, the weather here is very much, if you don't like it, wait five minutes because it will change. So what I'm constantly fighting with is this horrible glare from this window. Now, I could have gone lengthways. I think that still would cause glare problems and I hate working into the light. I find it incredibly confusing with um, you know, a bright window behind your screen. So up to now, I've simply had to work with the curtains closed, and <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely certain this nano glass is gonna drop in price, and I would really say the minute it does, I'd really go for it. It's, it's just, the quality of composition has genuinely improved because I think I'm just feeling healthier and happier. But I will close these windows for now because it's difficult to light with the changing weather. What I'm gonna do is move from left to right because it, it kind of represents the, the workflow. On my left screen, I have the most important document, which is what I call a music department Bible. This first tab, let's uh, move this over so you can see what I'm talking about. Why do I need a Bible? Well, it's why do we need a Bible? As a head of department, it's exactly that. It's not a one-man show. There's about six other people helping me on this project. Music supervisor, music editor. There is a, an assistant, my ass technical assistant. I have an assistant composer who is doing additional material, namely loads of songs. Mix engineer, myself. So the music editor is, I mean, it, music editing is a really broad kind of um, descriptor for, you know, from doing temp to sitting in at the dub. But basically they keep an eye on the edit and if that changes and if I need to be alerted to any of those changes, um, liaising between the edit and getting them stuff as and when they need it. Also liaising between the mix engineer, performing stuff like mini dubs. So when we do a pass, the music editor will do that. And then making sure all of the materials are delivered to the mix engineer and then in turn to the dub and then liaising with the dub for any additional stemming that they may require or any things that are missing or want to be moved around, that kind of stuff. So the music editor really has my back for how the score ends up and um, and basically is a, a, a bit of a, not I wouldn't say a barrier, but is certainly someone who can protect me from being totally inundated with requests so I can get on with the act of composing and revising. So this document basically is a way of the entire team staying on the same page, literally. And this first tab um, does just that. So you will see that we've got our episodes down there and this pretty much represents the process which we've ironed out over a couple of episodes with the client so we have a spotting session i get a first pass underway which i do relatively quickly i would say probably about two days per pass then i present that first pass so i know that's with them and it's very easy when you're working on multiple episodes to forget where you are with different episodes. I get first pass notes from the director and I action those. I then present my second pass, which then goes not only to the director, but it goes to the main client, the broadcaster, and I will receive notes from them. Now, naturally, this, this process may rotate a little bit more. There may be two, three, four passes. But by and large, this is this kind of skeleton workflow. I then action those notes. Oh, and by the way, if you think you're going to be able to do this job without notes, think again. It's something you have to learn to love. And the brilliant thing about working with brilliant people, and there's no exception here, 
is they make your score so much better and they become so much more confident in it that they want it to be loud they want it to play it large they're in love with it as much as you are so i i love receiving notes because it just makes you know you're kind of up there up against the canvas i you know it's it's objective and it's it's amazing both the director and the client on this job just makes the score better and also lets me know lets me kind of know how big to go how much to shape the music against the action all of these little pointers which i guess to a large degree a taste but also how they want the series to feel i had some really big orchestral sessions at the very beginning which may sound interesting, but I'll, I'll return to that. But I'm working on with folk musicians on every single episode locally, which is fantastic. So we get those orchestrated and copied. We record the musos. We receive the locked picture, just the way it's working out because it's an animation. Uh, we're unable to work with musicians to a locked picture simply because lock, the lock can kind of move. And uh, musicians, you need to pin them down a little bit more in advance up here because of their very demanding touring schedules, along with there's not that many studios up near Edinburgh and Glasgow. So we'll receive the lock after, and I'm usually confident that it won't be a structural recut. It'll be usually losing a few frames here and there it's a nightmare when frames are added but um, the lock will be received and then i will perform the conform to that lock to check all of the cues are correctly positioned at which point my assistant will track lay and send to the mix engineer and then we've got a little tick for when it's been sent to the farm so you can see that i'm currently working on one two three four five six and you can see that i'm very much at different phases throughout the process. I'm writing for episode six. I'm actioning notes for one and two. I'm waiting on notes for five. And what I'll be doing is grouping the episodes into twos. So I'll spend a day recording musicians on two episodes. Until I started making these status sheets, it was a total mind like spaghetti. But with this it just becomes very simple and i've said to the production i think me working on five to six episodes simultaneously is probably about as much as i should so that the quality doesn't suffer and i'm not splayed across again that would be so much more difficult if there wasn't the crew the team that i have you'll see that we're also writing songs and these are a little bit further behind i find the um it's interesting when you're working with the other side of the music industry like the non-media side it, it works at what cyclists would call a, a different cadence so they're playing catch up at the moment and i've got a couple of teams doing some songs so that we can catch up with the rest of the production recalls for dubs aren't again the process is less linear and whilst i don't like being responsible for the production to reopen dubs as they call it it's not the recall nightmare that it used to be with analog desks etc etc it's all in the box right so we have a contact list both with the client and or production and the music department we've got some important links and the reason for that is we're basically using dropbox which i don't think i'd recommend i just don't know what better alternative there is basically what we're finding is uh, the undo path becomes kind of corrupted with dropbox so if you hit undo certainly on an audio take it needs to poll dropbox to say remove this from everyone's dropbox so i think that there's probably a more elegant system but we just kind of cracked on and it seems to be working okay it's just it, it's a bit clunky but you'll see that the reason we've got these ticked these are the initials of the music crew is just to know who has access to what folders and there's currently one two three four five six moving through the process let's go back to the tabs here we've got a template cue sheet so we have for example let's look at one we've got cue codes the cue name so the name the file name will be the cue code plus the name 
we have the spotting notes from the directors and then notes back from both the director and client. These will eventually become the cue sheets from which these are submitted to the collection agencies. And so what we tend to do is once it's sent off to the mix is actually put our TCs in and out to calculate our running times, etc., etc. There's a guide to how the multi-track list is organized. And basically when we create workflows with flowcharts, they're all stored here as well. So we don't ever have to look for anything. It's always in the Bible. Workflow. I think the most important thing, if you've got a template that adds, say, an hour of fiddling around and prep in order to get it to the orchestrator or to the mix engineer, basically, and you've got 70 cues, you're looking at that costing you 70 hours at a point in the process where you really won't have that time. So the, the art of building a big, a good template is so that you don't have to create repetition in your workflow. And that is absolutely paramount when you're talking about, I would say on average up to 20 cues per episode times 22. Imagine how many hours that would be if it simply adds an hour of fiddling around. So I spent a month preparing this template and yeah, you could call it procrastination, but I call it productive procrastination. You're thinking about what the job is going to be whilst creating something that as an HOD you're going to benefit from. The second thing I think as a composer is your theme suite. I think it's really, really important to get your client, the director, the producer and the broadcaster to fall in love with your score before you start, to agree it in principle, to query certain themes. Is that dark enough? Is it light enough? So for me, I spent another month working on the theme suite. Let's have a look at that. So we've got basically a marker with the different themes up here. It's totaling 18 minutes and uh, each theme around the minute and a half, with the exception of maybe the tight titles, minute to two minutes. Um, so quite a lot of themes in there, lots of characters. And this is my template. So we've got everything in stacks, and these are summing stacks. And you can see here, it's quite a big old chunker. What's great about the stacks is that you can edit by section, but also that these are then summed to different locations. So if we have a look at our piccolos, we've basically got those going to bus 13. Bus 13 is then going to bus 2. But also we're going to bus 102 here. So there's a I've created a, an inter internal logic there. So if we look down at the stemming stage, We've got the stem verbs, and we're working in Atmos, so I'm working in 5.1. So basically, we've got our different reverbs here. So these are all 101, 101, 101. So we've got 102, that one that you saw for the woodwind here. And that's how I've got it, kind of. This is the center speaker, this is the left and right, and this is the LSRS. Then we've got our stem auxes. This is what we're monitoring through, and you'll see that these are basically very broad stems and the purpose of those playback stems so basically whatever section i feel there's a likelihood that we may have to record i have a separate stem for that so that we can knock it out back in the day they would have preferred maybe two or three stems for playbacks this day and age track counts are not a problem so woodwinds as expected coming in on bus two here but they're not coming out of the stereo outputs. They're then rebussing to bus 11, which is then the sum. And the, it's always really important to make the sum the sum of the stems so that basically they can pull up the sum and it sounds identical to the stems in unity. And then finally, I've got the stack tracks, and these are basically my multi-tracks. And you'll see that whilst they're detailed, they're not like multi multi tracks so if we have a look at here you'll see that certainly for the strings i've got solo long short 
plucks, harmonics and trems. This is also for effects and strings motions, which again is another sample library that I created. Which brings me on to that subject. You'll see here that within this theme folder, I've got loads of different, well, they look like cues, but they're actually the themes split off. So once the clients are happy with the, the main themes, what I do is go into an orchestral session and pay top scale sampling. So we'll do a variety of ostinatos, the themes like soloed out with the different sections, different speeds, different keys. And these are basically the preparation for the different individual themes. I call them assets, both for temp music, but also for me to actually work with. And one of the things I really enjoy doing is working in a hybrid sense of you have your big main theme, sweeping strings I always find kind of really difficult. Well, until a passion art came out, that's been a lifesaver on this actually. Um, but it's just great to have that electricity of the live players. And then as you go into some very kind of bespoke underscore, it's the samples that take over. And I really, I get a, a kick out of uh, doing that. So those are organized basically into audio and then also into samples. And in order to share uh, this project with Joe, we did a series of experiments to achieve the absolutely impossible and that is a seamless collaboration between the two of us so what we ended up doing is deciding what instruments is in the template we ruined our own sample drives by moving stuff like albion neo albion solstice eric whittaker out of that relocating it onto this drive and naming it identically between the two of us. In fact, I have a third SA drive, SSD, which is my traveling drive. And what's fascinating is when you just open up a queue on a totally different system, on a totally different hard drive, and off you go. And obviously that's possible with the use of Dropbox as well. Once the theme was done, we move on to the episodes. And you'll see this is full of my logic files, which are spat out my logic files, one pretty much for each queue, sometimes when queues run into each other. And again, I'm confident there aren't going to be any major structural changes to the, the cut. I'll do multiple queues in one. Maybe let's have a look at, which also speeds up the process. The less starts, the less imports that the engineer has to do, the less imports you have to do on sessions, etc., etc. Um I keep all of my old files. So what I tend to do is when there's a recut or a small tweak, I'll go up a point version. So where you see Dream Sequence version 2, it may be version 2.4 in Sauron. I'll get to that in a minute, as in the audio may be version 2.4. If the client asks for something radical, a rewrite or a, a real kind of rearrange, uh, then I'll go up a point um, so that I can then save the previous version and return to that if need be, it happens. The problem that I have working in this way, and I, I do urge you to help me here, I know there are workarounds, but they're so fiddly, is look at the size of these logic files. And these aren't monoliths, these are just the logic file, which I know is a folder with all of the sampler settings and possibly some of the audio loaded in. I, I don't understand. But can you imagine how big this Dropbox folder is going to get when you're talking about a single logic file taking up 7.26 gigabytes? It's mental. And then you duplicate them in the olds and all of that kind of stuff. So if there is a way of avoiding this, I don't know if it's I've got too long an undo thing or I don't know, or, you know, saving loads of versions. Um, there's another idiosyncrasy with logic. When you do save as, it just really wants to, particularly if you're moving it into a different folder location, it really wants to recreate all of the audio files. So I have duplicate audio all over the place. It's a real mess. And that makes me really nervous because as the episodes build up, uh, so this is going to get chunkier and chunkier. So we may have to move off Dropbox, which could be a disaster. So do the cues and then basically bounce them out 
into the Sauron sessions. And what are the Sauron sessions? Well, basically, I work with logic as the individual cues, and Sauron is Pro Tools. And basically, that'll be the entire show, but not only that, the entire series. So these get bounced out as 5.1 WAVs, which I then literally drag into here. But let's have a look at Sauron and what it's all about. So what you'll see here is this is episode one and it starts in hour one. But then this is what makes it look. Pro Tools so brilliant. Episode two is hour two, three, four, etc., etc. And basically, it's I'm working with playlists with the current cut. So let's look at one that was kind of busy. Let's uh, the first one we did was three. So there was several cuts of that. If I engage all groups, what you'll see is all of the previous cuts, and eventually I think four will disappear because it had less. Yeah, so it goes all the way back to I've had I had five cuts of that episode, and basically what I do is if there's a, if there will be another cut of this, I'll create another playlist and I just copy each playlist into the one before that. So these are all the latest cuts there. Then you'll see I've got my mixes checkerboarded for overlaps. And I guess that is, you know, the the last job of a composer, um, aside from being a head of department, is thinking about not only the thematic arc within the episode, but within the season and within the franchise. So I have an idea of where this is going, and I know I'm going to take it to 11 later on in this season, and it's going to hit 11 pretty much for the whole of the season finale. But I've only really gone up to about nine. And even when my clients came bigger, bigger, I'm, I'm mindful of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually hold that mega theme, the full exposition of it until the end. So it's just great to really have a degree of timidity, you know, at the beginning when the characters are really finding and understanding their situation, building in confidence. The other great thing about both working in this way, but also working on several episodes simultaneously, is you will make musical discoveries. So, in fact, a character in episode three will not have her correct theme because I didn't find it until episode five. However, I'm still working on one, two and four. So what I've done is gone back and revised her theme within those episodes. Therein lies an advantage of stacking, even if it is kind of quite heavy on the old noggin. So questions for you. Is this system potty? I mean, the reason why this computer may be struggling is because I have 500 instances of contact. I'm running multi-tracks that are quite deep, and I've got a lot of reverbs. Is there any way that I can make these logic files smaller, but a way that it just is automatic? I don't have to go in and... You know, that thing of it goes, do you want to tidy up? Would you like me to get rid of all of this audio? It's like, yes, but not from the drive, from from logic. What would you recommend? Um, let me see. I just actually put a, th a thing on Twitter. If you don't, if you don't subscribe to my um, social, social media, it's linked in the video description down below. Um, and sometimes I throw out questions and stuff like that. So any questions here? Often, this is from... Marco Inello, uh, often one would hear some cues used verbatim across many episodes. Is that a case of one to rule them all, or might there be new versions featuring some very subtle changes? I totally agree. The problem I have as a parent is is these kids, are, these they're going to watch these 22 episodes in a weekend, and what I can't bear is cookie-cutter scores. So it is very, very common practice, and, and I've done it, and it's what's requested from clients, to provide a library of music 
and then just to let them get on with it and maybe they'll go listen can you just have a look at this cue and score that particular chase and basically I said and you know it is you know making a rod for my own back I said I want to score every episode and for every episode to have a tonal quality all of its own to date I haven't I haven't cut and pasted a single cue in the six episodes I've been working on. Yes, I may start from a theme starting point, uh, from the theme suite, but I really, I think that just for the sake of parental sanity, I think Cookie Cutter is not right. And I know there's a few composers who refuse to cut and paste. So yes, uh, reusing themes, yes, re... But it's, you know, for me, it's it's it just gets so boring. And I love it as themes grow and you work out a variation and you work out how to make it less repetitive, but also joyously familiar in the sense of, I don't know, you know if the themes are strong you can put them in any instrument and in fact i'm doing loads of easter eggs in this series every single a bit like the simpsons every single opening titles sequence is orchestrated slightly differently um and performed for each episode which is a lot of fun um it's great to be given the opportunity to do one's job properly and being given a month to prepare a template a month to do a theme suite, being allowed to record a massive orchestral session at the beginning of the process. All of these things are an absolute delight and are not the norm, certainly not thus far in my career. Always wondered if you work linear, always one episode at a time until you're done. Or with live musicians, would you do multiple shows to maximum time booking a recording studio? Yes, Joshua, but with the Musicians Union in this country, you have to be careful about multi-episodic use. So you need to talk to the Musicians Union. We have done a deal where we pay a particular scale and we're allowed to record two episodes in one session. But that's something that we have negotiated with the Musicians Union. Uh, it's quite a mundane question, but how do you go about organising, naming, filing your sessions? Is it it is, for some reason, a weak part of my workflow. Well, for me, it's uh, season, episode, queue number. And I start the queue numbers from one. That's not what they do in The Simpsons, apparently. Apparently, they're on cube, M-O, well, M, one, 10,000 and something. Um, so uh, each episode has its unique um, numbering. So it's C so uh, I have an acronym for the for the show. And for me, I do it like uh, airport acronyms. So um, um, it's just three letters. So the hierarchy I use is the acronym ABC season one, zero, one, which is the episode M. This is very important for the audio files because when they leave this building and they go to the edit, they're in with a lot of sound files dialogue effects the m says this is music what's it doing in this folder so m then the q number which if it's in the single digits is will be zero and i mean if if you're working on a mega film it might be zero zero because you might get into the hundreds absolutely we've spotted it wrong if a 25 minute show has got over 100 cues um and then uh, the queue number which is one so if a queue a new queue appears between abc 101 m02 and abc 101 m03 it'll become abc 101 m o 2 a and just simply put uh, those and if i join queues up i just tend to hyphenate them so that we don't get the phone calls between the mix engineer going i don't see got 03 but i don't have 04 and there's an 05 so again another thing about process is just saving these repetitions and it can really hold people up if they feel they haven't got everything or indeed that you are create, creating a culture and an environment where they can't really trust what you have given them. So all of these uh, uh, methods may seem incredibly anal, but it's just it's just to avoid unnecessary amounts of work or stress. Uh, do I make a new theme for every episode? Well, on this, kind of. Maybe a little motif or sometimes an instrument that features more heavily. So one instrument 
we've got a harp in it that doesn't really appear anywhere else at the moment um so again that that keeps it fresh yeah directors do love a character theme i think it's a it's a trope that uh stems right back to possibly greek theater the origins of of our art form um the word q comes from the light motif the moment at which an actor knows they've got to go on stage is when they hear the light motif played by the pit band that is the cue for the actor to come on stage which we've now adopted for the various different cues the moments of music whether that be a long 20 minute action sequence or a little sting it helps you form an emotional connection to different characters i think most sublimely demonstrated in the scores for star wars where um when darth vader walked in the room you'd go uh oh, this doesn't feel very nice and when luke walked in you you go oh i feel warm towards him and robert treves would love to know how um my general workflow for tv and how you organize and manage everything well hopefully i've been through it in a somewhat slapdash manner if you have any more questions put them in the comments down below and i will read them and will endeavor to answer them where appropriate um thanks for watching till the end it's been a long one today um there's something well, a few things you may have noticed, um, namely that I don't have a lovely posh modular synth behind me and that rack's gone empty. Um, something is changing and I was going to announce it this week, but we're not quite ready yet. So that's going to happen next week. So subscribe, ding that bell to be notified. And there's maybe something else that's catching your eye that I see some of you talking about. All will be revealed then. One of those for greeks and theater where would we be without them see you next time